good morning, everybody. How, how many people were like at the party last night? Wow, that's a this is a weird, a weird thing to see a, a cross Venn diagram model of who was there and who is here, and I'm I'm pretty surprised, but I, I guess I sh I should have believed in all of you a little a little more, and for that I apologize. But thank you for coming. How many people went to Third Street Dive afterwards too? Slightly less. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm Fuzzy Knop. This is poning people personally, or all the alliteration all the time, I guess. Uh, here's my About Me slide. This is the best day I've ever had at work. Uh, and then just to kick this off, I suppose um, we're just going to have to play a little bit of a pretend game, right? Because I wanted to use real examples, but then it was, it was too hard because I had to react too much stuff. So I just, to make this talk, I just kind of started off and I came up with a premise that uh, before this was originally created before season two of Rick and Morty came out and if you've seen Rick and Morty you're you're like yeah that's a good show and imagine on, you know in an episode or two when the when the season ends and we can apply the same train of thought and it's like still gonna make sense and we can pretend that you know we want to get inside one of the computers or inside the servers that, that house everything that Rick and Morty has ready before the season releases, right? So we're just going to pretend that they said, yes, you can, you can red team us, you can come into our environment and do whatever you need to do to see if it's possible to steal the, our, our, our goods and the goods being whatever they have. Maybe, you know, storyboards, recordings. So, okay, let's play, let's play pretend. Now, the first step of poning is, is recunescence. <laughs> This is bad pun raccoon for you. Now we're gonna we're gonna pretend and actually be quite creepy in order to to accomplish this. And you may be finding yourself asking like, man, this is really creepy throughout this. Uh, don't don't worry too much about that. Uh, the first step in our in our recunescence is uh, we're gonna create a, a creepy doc. And I like to use Google Docs for a number of reasons. And I'm gonna be using Google a lot for this. And uh, if in your head you're saying, hey, that's not okay, you can't be putting stuff in Google, like, don't worry about it, everyone's putting stuff in there anyways. Let's, let's assume that our target is also putting stuff in Google so they don't mind that we're putting everything in there because there's a lot, of, a lot of value in it. And in our doc that we're going to make, we're going to build out some, some very personal profiles on people to get kind of some leverage, and, and you'll see what we do with it. And we're gonna we're gonna build it with you know pictures, links, and notes. And one of the reasons we're gonna do this manually instead of automating it all is because as we do it, we're gonna learn about the people a little bit more. And this will be useful in creating a initial fish to get in, and then later determining who's valuable to move to, etc. And yes, maybe you're like creepy. Maybe you're like it's time consuming. Uh, maybe you're thinking, well, what if my target company has a, a lot of employees, right? You know, Rick and Morty, it's hosted you know, by Adult Swim, they're run by Cartoon Network, I'm going to attack all of Cartoon Network and start looking for it? Mm, no, right? We're going to focus in on the thing we want, and then from that, I'm going to use that to find the exact people I want, not the whole organization. And then using those people, I'm going to get the thing I actually want, because they have access to it already. Now, first step that I usually take is I just go site, LinkedIn, looking for no jobs because I want people who already work there, not job ads, and just the thing I'm interested in. In this case, it's Rick and Morty. I'm a, I'm a big fan. And you can see all the LinkedIn tabs I have open. That's just the first, you know, the first step. Just open all the tabs, queue up all this stuff, and start looking through it. Now, as I look through it, I'm going to screenshot everything. And this is going to actually if I put all these screenshots into Google Drive, Google will do OCR on them. So that later, at any point in time, I'll be able to search for any keyword, and if it appears anywhere in the screenshots, it'll pop up with a screenshot. So if I'm like, oh man, I think I saw this before, I can just search for it and pop, 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 up come the screenshots, I can see everything that was there when I originally saw it. And uh, there's a few tricks that I use on OSX specifically. 
Uh, because Google Drive, you can't just search within a folder. It seems like a pretty basic functionality, but it's, it doesn't really exist in Google Drive. It just searches everything in there. And if you're doing, you know, multiple engagements, multiple targets, you want to be able to organize your thoughts. So the easiest way is just to rename your screenshots so they always have some kind of identifier for the thing you're working on. So it just, I, I normally just script this, but here's the command that will change your screenshot name. So I can say my, like, engagement name is Rickdiculous, and Bob is the guy that I'm doxing at the moment. So I can just call it Bob Rickdiculous, and that way I can have an identifier of what I was kind of doing at the time, and then also, you know, the project that I was working on at the time. And then to make uploading easier, I can just change the screenshot output location right to my Google Drive folder with this other command. So you can have a script that you constantly run as you, you know, swap from one target to another, and then you just update it really quick, type in the new name of the person, good to go. So here we start on LinkedIn. This is the first guy I pull up, and, and this is basically just screenshots of like what I did when I decided to run through this thought exercise. And this is the first guy I see. So I just take a screenshot at the top of his profile, take a screenshot where he works, read it. And obviously he works on the stuff I want, and that's pretty useful to me. Take a screenshot where he studied, find his Google Plus page, find his personal website, find his Twitter, find his Facebook page, which has a, a ton of really strange information, like his AOL Instant Messenger name, because it's very, it's, it's still in, guys, it's still on, so if you want to add me Fuzzy Knop and AOL Instant Messenger. And then we just change the screenshot name, move on to the next person. Now, this guy, when, when I pulled him up, I actually saw that he doesn't work there anymore. So I just kind of screenshotted the main page, but I didn't deep dive on him, because he actually doesn't have access anymore to the things that I want. I'll repeat the process again. Next person, you know, storyboard artist, cool. Go through the same process for another person. In the end, I end up with something that looks like this. I got a picture of the dude, picture of his avatar, got his name up there, his LinkedIn, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram, website, YouTube, Google Plus, where he lives, his phone number, Skype, ALS Messenger, his email, and some notes about, you know, what he actually does and why I might be interested in him. And then I have something for the next person, and I have something for this last guy. And I just did three here. And uh, this, this last one, it's not a lot of information, right? It's not very personal. I couldn't find an actual picture of him. I don't have a ton of information. I don't really know a lot about this, this Maximus fellow. Well, I have this pile of screenshots in Google Drive. So maybe I missed something. So I search Maximus in Google Drive. And what I find is you know, a list of all the screenshots that I had when I was looking for stuff on Maximus. But then I also find Brent, our buddy Brent. Hey, Brent, what are you doing up there in my search results for Maximus? That's pretty strange. Pull this up. Whoa, these guys are hanging out in real life. That's a very interesting little fact. Maybe these guys know each other. Maybe they're good friends. Maybe they went to college together. Maybe they uh, all went to the same university. With this other, other girl here. So the reason of doing this is not just solely to, to creep on people. And while it is kind of fun sometimes, uh, it's really about, you know, finding someone to attack, but there's only half of it, you know. There's, it's actually more about becoming this person, right? Because we can craft a fish with, you know, a highly targeted email judging on things that we found on social media. But if we find enough stuff on social media about someone, we can just completely impersonate them. We can become them and then use that trust that's already established between people to, to, to just ask their friends already. And uh, I only built three profiles here. Uh, it was the first three people I found in my LinkedIn search. And interestingly enough, all three are connected in some way. And typically, I would spend, I would, actually, I would spend about a week building 30, 30 or more profiles. And the more profiles I have, the more connections, and the more attack surface. And just as a note, it isn't always best to pick the two people that you find are the most closely connected. Maybe it's good to find two people that worked together at one point, but maybe you think they don't work together anymore. Maybe it's best to find people that you know there's, they have a slight familiarity, but they're not just like buddy-buddy. So because Brent and Maximus hang out in real life, I probably wouldn't use... Oh, God. Because Brent and Maximus hang out in real life, I wouldn't use Brent to target Maximus because they might be, you know, chilling in real life at some point and be like, hey, why'd you send me this file? And they'd be like, what file? So that'd be bad. So let's, let's, put, our, let's put our recon to use. And Google's going to help us again here. I'm going to pick someone cool. I'm going to pick Brent. Poor Brent. Sorry, Brent, if you're, if you're watching this. I'm really, I'm not, not really sorry. 
So I'm going to register a similar email for this guy. You know, I'm going to be brentnell 11 at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, I just, just added an extra one to the email he actually uses, so it's not too strange. And, uh, you know, I'm going to become this man. My man, right? And I'm going to duplicate everything from his Google Plus profile. And so this is the original one. This is the duplicate one. Original, duplicate. The only thing that's different in this case, other than some dates of when things were created, is how many followers I have and how many views I've had. But you know, we, can, we can fix that, actually. Now, when I use this personality that I've created to, to fish, I'm not going to just like start sending malware everywhere. I'm going to use two steps. First step is going to just be establish contact with people. See if, see if they're actually going to talk to me, if they're actually going to believe who I am. Because my first step is spraying malware out. It only takes one person that's like, I know this isn't real. They report it, and then suddenly my whole campaign is ruined, and I have to vary my tactics too much. But if I pick a few people, and I send targeted emails, and they say, oh, hey, yeah, like I can totally check this thing out for you, then I can send my actual payload, and I, I'm pretty sure they're going to run it in that case. Uh, not sure why I picked this image. So here's what our normal fish looks like, standard email. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, I got this new prototype, you know, does it look okay on your screen? It looks fine on my laptop, but my mom said it looks bad on her computer. You know, come up with something better, and I attach my, my loldongs.jar file. And what they get is this. Because we've duplicated their Google Plus profile, Google's going to populate a lot of things for us, including the avatar that I've stolen, uh, any recent posts they had, and it's going to put this in the side, it's going to say added circles. It, it gives a lot of legitimacy to this standard email that I'm sending out. <coughs> now you're saying, oh, you can, like, you can attach a jar to Gmail, and, and yes, you can. Standard Gmail accounts, not going to block jars. Uh, actually, this is the list of things that are blocked, and there's also a couple of uh, compressed archives that are going to be scanned and blocked if they have these types of files inside them as well. Jars aren't blocked by default. Now, if you encounter official people who apparently you know, are maybe running inside a Google org or something like that, it's possible that they could have a policy that does block jars. And that's a pretty common thing that I've run into. It's, and it's actually not a super problem, even if you want to even if you still want to send a jar, because Google will actually help us again. Uh, they'll be like, yes. What we do is we upload the blocked file type to Google Drive, and then we just share it to the victim. And we can include a message in there, and then what they're going to get is going to look like this. It's going to be sent on behalf of via Google Drive with the same name, and it may even push my name, my, my fake email off the screen some if their screen resolution is small enough. And it's going to say, hey, here's the following file. Here's this loldongs.jar thing that you, you may need. And you can click open for it. All the populated info on the side with my picture, with my recent posts are still there. <coughs> and Google serves up the file. Thanks, Google. And if they download it, it's like, this file may be malicious, but how many times have you seen that and still ran it? Probably every time. And uh, you may be thinking, does this work on EXEs too? And you, you bet your ass it does. Demo.exe comes right through, delivered via Google Drive. Why not? You know, can't send it through email, but Google will host it for you and deliver it if you like. So here's a here's a real example. I, I work I work internal red team for for a large company in the in the Bay Area, and they acquire companies from time to time, and we red team them. And I'm trying to get into a newly acquired company. And I decide to target a UX UI designer. My girlfriend is a designer, and I think I like I know a lot about this. I can easily pretend to be a designer. So this is going to be a really, really awesome fish. And uh, so from the parent company, pretending I'm from the parent company, I'm a guy that works there, and I've seen that we've acquired the new company. And I'm thinking, man, like that new company is super cool. I would really like to go work there instead because, you know, it's got like a cool, trendy office vibe and I'm here at this big company. I think this is pretty, pretty legitimate, pretty possible. So I register this guy, a brand new email, clone his Google Plus. And I had picked him also because on his portfolio, when you go to click like contact, instead of like listing his email, he's got like an email form. So if someone sees this email and kind of wants to like verify that it's the right person or they reach out to his portfolio and want to contact him, they, they might just reply to my email because there's no email to compare it to. So I thought that was a, was a plus. And here's the email I sent, slightly redacted. I say, hey, cat, 
My name's Cam. I do UX and UI design at Company. I came across your profile online, wanted to reach out, figured why not, now that we are all in the same big corporate umbrella. Truth be told, I'm looking to make a move to a smaller office and work on more intimate projects. I was wondering if I could pick your brain a little about so-and-so company's design team and get a feel for the culture and general scope of projects before I get too serious. Sorry if this is an imposition, I just always prefer to reach out to fellow designers directly before I make the leap into the corporate cockles. Now, this was someone that I found online during my initial social recon, and I saw that they were a designer. I also saw that they posted online publicly saying, hey, reach out to me because I want to hire people, I want referral bonuses. And uh, I'm thinking this is pretty, pretty, going to be pretty successful. And it, it fails. I get no response. And I'm feeling very anxious, and uh, I, I wait 10 days. I get no response. I was expecting an instant response. And I felt sad. That's your cue. Aww. Aww. Thank you. Thank you. But then, actually, something magical happened. I get this email 10 days later. Hey, Cam, it was great and very serendipitous meeting you this morning. Coincidentally, Kat CC'd here happened to catch your email that got filtered into her spam folder this morning as well. As I mentioned, I think it would be great for the three of us to meet. Kat and I both live in San Francisco. I'd be happy to meet up one morning before work. Thursday or Friday next week happen to work for you. I certainly wouldn't mind meeting at your swanky something site class. I don't even know what that is. I know Alex has been trying to schedule a time for you to come by our office for demos. Who, who's Alex? I don't know which I think will give you a much better sense of the broader company and culture. However, we're moving to a new office, et cetera, et cetera. Let me know if there's a morning that works good for you. And at this point, I'm, I'm trying to realize what's happening, and I realize, I'm thinking, oh, man, am I a wizard? <laughs> this guy was actually doing the thing that I made up. He was actually looking for this job at this company, and he actually worked at the parent company. And uh, later on, the only reason I didn't get like, an instant response is because my message went to spam. Lesson learned here, if you spin up a new Gmail account for someone to impersonate them, you need to let it age a little bit. It's like, you know, Gmail accounts are like cheese, I guess, or, or wine, or, you know, something that's better with age, like, like old socks. And if I, had, if I had sent some emails to some other accounts I controlled and, like, replied and, and waited a few weeks, this would not have gone to spam. But Gmail knows that I created it, like, you know, 10 minutes ago before sending the email, and they take it to spam because that's highly suspect behavior. It makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> the irony is um, part of the, the, the stuff that this company uses internally, and maybe even part of their own product, it merged my email into a, another thread with this guy. So suddenly my email comes in and they're like, oh, hey, like our product's supposed to take care of this and merge all these weird communications together for us. And they, they go in and they're like, oh, yeah, merge. These two are the same person. So now there's like one big thread with them talking to this guy, and I'm now part of it. And now when they click reply to it, they're replying to me instead of him. So that, I learned this after the fact. And so basically, I was like this. Of course, I send back this email. I would love to. Let me check my schedule, and I'll let you know which is better. Also, I've been working on some front-end UI design, trying to learn a bit of coding on this website to diversify my skill set a bit. I have a demo that I would love to get your opinions on. It wasn't as appreciated here, but I think you guys might find it interesting. It obviously isn't official, so you might have to right-click and click open to get it to launch. Thanks. So this, this app that's attached, which is a DMG, because waiting 10 days, I, I didn't stop. I didn't stop and wait. I was doing other things, and I had did one fish, and I got back this screenshot where they're like, hey, it didn't run. I got this message that says Java's not installed. I'm like, damn, Java's not installed. Okay, so I just compile it into a DMG at this point. So uh, the app just throws a Java error message, and the fact that it's a DMG, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And uh, I get two shells, and uh, the dupe does not get a job there. How, how personal is that, right? Uh, yeah. So um, maybe, maybe this email tactic, it's a little old school, right? It's not so personal. And, you know, maybe I can't always be psychic and a wizard and get that lucky with a fish like that. Uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't always go like that, and, you know, it's not my fault this is happening. I, I'm not sure what I was thinking when I decided to pick these images to put there. I thought there'd be some context, but honestly, um, sorry, not sorry. So a little more personal, Google Hangouts, right? That's like direct messaging, it's real time. 
you can see if they've seen it. And one of the interesting things is if you've ever used the like, Google Hangout Chrome extension and, and talked to people and you were like, oh, I'd like to send this person an email. Let me just like copy what their email is. You can't find it in this little UI here. It doesn't, you can't even like go to options and be like view email. So there are a few caveats. One is if you're in the, the Gmail portion, like the old legacy part of the app, and you try and contact, contact someone, they're going to get this message that's like, so-and-so wants to contact you. Now there's this weird like Google Hangout connector that exists that causes it to show up like this instead of their email. So if you see this, it's almost always like this for everybody. But at first it has their name on it and then the normal like Google stuff that's at the end. If you click no here, the next time you send them a message and the third time you send them a message, they'll get this but it doesn't have the fake name anymore. Interesting caveat, Google's trying to obviously kind of prevent the thing that I'm doing. Um, if they say no after that, they're assuming you're a very spammy, annoying person and they might want to block you. So the option to block now becomes possible. So be mindful that each message you send is going to trigger this in the, in the, the Gmail app. But if you add them to a circle on Google+, Plus, instead of just trying to direct message the email, they get something that looks like this and it looks really legit. And it doesn't have your fake email in there at all. Now they get an email also that looks like this, and then they get this pop-up within the Hangouts like web interface. So if you're in Hangouts, you see this at the top. So-and-so has added you to a circle. You can click Add, one click, it adds them back. The email, one click, Add Circles. If you're authenticated, it adds them back. Now, once you, they've added you back, it's, it gets pretty interesting. And if you're asking, like, does this work? Do people actually use Google Plus? <laughs> Apparently, yes. And uh, here are some of my new friends. This was like five minutes of adding people. And two people added me, and a couple people added me after that that were like <laughs> friends of those friends. So then I went and looked up what, what they had to do with. And now all these people, I can like direct message. Now, there is, there is one more caveat. If they're inside a Google org, like a custom company's Google org, they will get a message that looks like this. So on the left is the, the web interface version. It's like, Josh is using an account from outside your organization. Careful. And then in the uh, Hangouts version, the Chrome extension, it looks like this at the top. Now, as soon as they like scroll or interact with the window at all, the message disappears. So it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of fishy, but it's kind of not. And it kind of depends. You just have to be mindful that that will show up. So if you're pretending to be inside the company, it's probably not going to work. But if you're pretending to be on your personal email at home after hours or something like that, that's actually pretty normal. Yes. Uh, if on, on the right hand side, if it sets you know, 18 lines of text in your first message, would that just scroll it off? Uh, no. Okay. I mean, it would it just scroll off actually like as soon as they like click into it and start typing. Okay. So if they're starting to type back, it's gone. And if they scroll, I, it, it disappears like after a few seconds, okay. honestly. <laughs> So with the default settings, if they, if they add us back to a circle, they, they don't get the funky message that's like, hey, someone's trying to contact you. It's weird. They just get contacted. They don't have the option to like approve you to contact them because you're now mutually trusted via circles. This, this uh, you're not in the same organization will still happen though. And so it actually like doesn't hurt to add people to circles in Google+, see what comes out of it. Anyone that adds us back, it's a potential target, someone that we can message, someone that we can leverage. And uh, yeah, okay. So here's another real example. And this is kind of like when things go wrong. Here I am pretending to be this lovely gentleman here on the right. And I'm like, hey, got a sec. This is in the middle of the day. It's not till 5 p.m. that I get a response. Oh, hey, sorry, I just saw this. Now, I'm using this guy and targeting this girl because He's kind of like her boss, but not quite. They're both on the sales team. He leads one sales team, and she's on another sales team, but I can see that they've worked together in the past. So I think, I think this is good. They have some mutual you know, trust, but they don't work together on a daily basis, uh, presumably. So I get the message at 5, and then around like 8, I see that this person's still online. So I say, oh, are you still online? Because I figured they're at home, which is a, probably a good time to target them. And they say, yep. Is this James? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Because <laughs> I'm thinking it's a little fishy that they're confirming my identity. And then they're like, no, really, who is this? I'm standing next to James right now. Uh, <laughs> apparently, apparently in the Bay Area, people work kind of late. 
<laughs> so um, the good news is, is there's this button, and I just blow it away and move on, right? <laughs> I lose nothing, there's no, you know, I never get caught. No one reports this weird thing to security. Uh, after I deleted it, I thought, oh man, I should have just pretended to be someone that he knew from college, like pranking him, like, ha ha, you should try and figure who this is and, and, and egg them on a little bit more. It probably wouldn't have made a difference, but we didn't get caught by this anyways. No one reported it, pretty, pretty interesting. Okay, so assuming that the person we're pretending to be is not literally standing next to the person we're trying to target, They'll, we'll probably get a shell. And let's assume that going forward, the shell we have gives us like interactive SSH sessions. So we basically are typing at the terminal on their box via an SSH talk. So what now? Man, I'm really thirsty. And there was like a smear off ice in here. I'm not gonna drink it all, but <laughs> this is this is not the way I wanted my morning to go. Mmm, sugar. Oh god. It's disgusting. <laughs> okay, if I'm on a local OSX box, and I had mentioned this last time I talked here because I just discovered it, OSScript will allow you to tell any dialogue inside OSX to basically prompt with anything and allow people to type stuff in, and you can choose whether there's an okay and a cancel or just an okay, and then you can choose from the default icon. So basically, if you make an app pop up and say something, that app will just assume the icon that's normally there, and then there's a couple different versions. So you could get it with like a little triangle on it, you could get it with a red circle on it, depending on the, the type that you get. So, and this is basically just me telling the System Preferences app to activate and then pop up a dialog box that says software update requires your password to continue. And that's it. If they type it, I get this directly back to the terminal, whatever they type it. If they click escape, it goes away, and I see that they exited the prompt without typing anything, in which case, if I were on their box, I just prompt it again, because that's what your computer normally does. It asks you for your password and annoys you until you type it in. So this is like not strange to people at all. And then maybe their system password is not the same password as something that like ha holds more secrets. So maybe they have you know, one password or some other password manager. You can just make that password manager pop up and say, yo, like one password requires your password to continue. You know, the LastPass app, which doesn't even exist, could require their password to continue. So I thought maybe I could use this for, for YubiKey. And just to, just to show you like what it actually looks like in action. Yep. When you run this command, this is saying, tell the keychain access app, this secure keychain app, to prompt and say, hey, YubiKey requires resynchronization. Please enter your token value using your YubiKey to continue. Does that work? Probably. Text return? Probably. Pretty neat. So right after I first talked about this, someone was like, hey, you can do the same thing on Windows using PowerShell, and it looks super legit. So uh, shout out to at Heinz Relly who hit me up on Twitter like right after I first said, like, check this OSA script stuff out. It's awesome. And he's like, yeah, check it out with PowerShell too. And uh, so this is like three lines of PowerShell. It prompts up with a default part of the natural UI for Windows. What I would totally type my password into this. I don't know about you guys. We're all very paranoid. But if my computer asked me for my password, I normally type it in, especially if it looks like this. So. I was like, that's really cool, but I didn't get to use that because on an engagement where I was on Windows Box and PowerShell is blocked by bit nine. And so in some cases, you know, PowerShell signed by Microsoft, if someone blocks it by bit nine, maybe you can get around that by, by just saying you know, update PowerShell to the newest version, right? Is someone going in and adding all the new hashes? If they are, is there a time window that maybe a new version might be valid? But say you can't do that. Let's say Java is allowed. Java is the only thing you have. Or maybe just Python's allowed. Or some scripting language, something that you could use to interact with the computer and run something. It doesn't have to be an executable. <clears throat> so, and this is this is shout out to one of the very brilliant Spanish members of my team who always comes up with the most devilish things to, to, to do. And you know, sometimes it's like chopping people's hands off and like mailing them to their kids to ask for a password, which we don't normally do that. But sometimes it's something genius like this. This is all Java. A full screen overlay. Java. Looks like a lock screen, suddenly. If my computer locked, I'd be like, oh, maybe I fat fingered it and 
I would type in my password to unlock it, because that's what I always do. And that's what users always do, and this works you know, every time, 60% of the time. And also, it works in Linux. Shout out to Cause for messaging me and being like, hey, check it out, it works in Linux too. It's one command. It looks legit. The background screen dims. It prompts them for this. And if they type it in, text gets echoed out to the terminal, just like all the other methods. So maybe have root already. And now these, these techniques we just talked about are really good for, say, like, I don't have root. I just have the local user's account, and I want their password. But maybe I have the ability to move laterally already, and I just want to take more because I'm greedy. So you can use a PAM module for credential collection. And it's not so good for privilege escalation because you need root to install it. But if you have root on a box, you can add a PAM module. And then you can suddenly get SSH creds from anyone who logs into the box. You could suddenly get SSH creds, or you could suddenly get creds for you know something like a screensaver. So if you wanted to, you could, excuse me, you could do something like this. <laughs> Okay, so here we have is like a PAM module, and the PAM module is pretty, pretty simple. It's basically just the bare minimum that a PAM module needs, and what it's going to do, it's going to import the normal libraries for PAM modules, and it's just going to say, hey, like, do the normal prompting for PAM. You can find examples of this online, and then you just add one little extra thing in here that is going to write out the credentials into syslog also, and then you just go on and do whatever you want to do after that. And so I don't fat finger all of these, and in the interest of time, I prepared last night at 5 a.m. <laughs> so in this instance, I think it'd be cool to backdoor the screensaver. My password is Rick and Morty right now, by the way. Don't hack me. Thank God I turned my Wi-Fi off before this. Huh? So all I need to add is auth sufficient and then the name of my module right at the top. Sufficient is saying that, OK, if this auths, it's cool, but if it doesn't, it's cool too. Just go on to the next one. So you could actually add like a back door in your PAM module. You could say, hey, if someone types in like a special password, no matter what the like password is in Etsy Shadow or, or anywhere else in the system or how curb works, if they type in this password, approve, and then you'll be logged in. So even if like passwords change, you could keep access to a box with a PAM module like this. And then all you do is actually just copy it to on OS X, it's system library. I don't know. On OS X, it's user lib pam, and then the name of the pam module. And this is the same way you'd install like a pam module to like enable YubiKey on the device. And then if you're at the terminal and you know you're feeling devilish, and in in the case that I used this, it was at the end of an engagement. I had access to to basically everything already, but I just wanted passwords for the people running incident response. So, you know, they're responding to me in the environment, I'm getting kicked out, and I'm saying, like, look, I have all these creds, I can go to people's boxes, I can get root on them. What if I had the cred of this guy? I could log in, I could see what they're doing in the incident response, I could, you know, find, get into their email, find the email that has, like, the, the contact info for the bridge that they're doing the incident response on, and call in, just listen to what they're doing. So, ooh, sexy. <laughs> but I'm not the only one who said that. So if I do this, bam, my screensaver pops up. If I type my password in, suddenly it's in syslog. Here. Bam. So I could continue catching credentials from SSH, from screensaver, or whatever. Aw, thank you. But wait, there's more. So if I'm on a box, maybe I want privilege escalation some other way. And maybe I, I'm afraid to prompt the user because they're very astute. And they, they might realize that there's something janky going on and I, I don't want to get caught. So everyone has these password managers, right? And the functionality of a password manager is, you know, you go to it, click, click. It puts it in the clipboard temporarily, hopefully temporarily, or it puts it in the clipboard until something else overwrites it. And then, you know, then you're able to paste it where you want it to be. So why not just write a thing that monitors the clipboard, dumps it out over and over and over and over and over again? It works. It's interesting. It's kind of slow. So you might be wondering, like, man, what's the user doing on the box because you're getting impatient that the password isn't in the clipboard yet? So maybe you want to see what's on their screen on OS X. 
pretty easy command, screen capture. This dash X is very important. Without this, you will get and a screen flash. Not super stealthy. <laughs> and then the output file. It's interesting, it doesn't require root, and uh, it works remotely over SSH. If you're on Linux, the first thing I found was this display equals zero and then use GNOME screenshot. But with GNOME screenshot, I couldn't find a way to make the screen flash go away. And it needs permissions to actually like kill the audio file that's responsible for making that noise. Um, so screw that. Because <laughs> people might be like, what the fuck is going on? Now I know why I put that image there. Since, uh, since we need sudo anyways to like steal the password, we can steal it with gksudo. We can just at sudo apt install image magic, and then we could do something like display equals zero, import dash silent, very important. The window is the root window, meaning the entire desktop, and then our output file. And we can do this to just keep capturing what's on the user's screen, see what they're doing. Are they active? Are they checking their email? Are they writing an email to security saying, hey, my computer's doing something weird? Interesting sidebar. If they do write an email saying, hey, my computer's doing something weird, if you have their password and you're in their email, you could easily follow up with security on their behalf and say, hey, um, never mind. Everything's totally cool. <laughs> And then you could do a little bit of inbox management for them, creating filters so that anything from security is also just sent directly to trash. And if that happens, I can tell you for certain, it will buy you at least an extra week in the target environment. We can do screenshots in uh, Windows 2. Uh, PowerShell, the link's there. Boom. So I thought, Maybe I want to know how to record audio, too. And this isn't something I regularly use, but I thought it'd be an interesting path to go down to, build out the toolkit a little bit more. I thought I could leverage OSA script to do it because it's been so useful already. Uh, the problem is it's, it's buggy, and you have to use Qt to do it. And I, I started to feel like this. Uh, the story kind of goes like this. You, you be me. You decide to add this slide. It's going to be easy. Uh, you start writing some Apple script. Everything's going smoothly. Audio is recording. You're very happy. Only took 20 minutes, feeling very happy of yourself now. And then all that's left is to save the file to disk. And, and 10 hours later, you still can't save the file. And it's actually because sandboxing issues in the new version won't let it like have this handle to the audio program and then let that program have the permissions to also write something to disk. So, so I find this solution. It fixes the permission error. And I'm like, yes, the permission error is fixed. But actually, nothing gets written to disk. So that actually doesn't fix it. Find a solution for video, and it works. This is video of the desktop, so you could actually just screen cap the desktop in this instance, or you could take audio. And uh, part of the way I'm doing this is I'm using QuickTime. And I'm making OSA script launch QuickTime, and I'm making OSA script trigger an audio or a screen recording at the same time. And this is all OSA script just saying, hey, like, do these actions on my behalf, or on the user's behalf, I suppose. And then after it does that, you know, move the file out of our temp, something like that. Now, the result is because I've set the size of QuickTime to one pixel by one pixel when I'm launching it, if you click the QuickTime thing that pops up in the dock, then you don't see anything. It's just QuickTime pops up, and then it's like done recording, QuickTime disappears. And when I was trying to recreate this over and over to like make sure it works so I could do a demo, the reason I'm not doing a demo is because it doesn't work the same every time. Every once in a while, nothing would pop up. I'm like, cool. Sometimes stuff would record when that happened. Like, cool. Sometimes it wouldn't. Not so cool. Sometimes two quick times would pop up. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, dog science in this case, I suppose. Um, if you click it, nothing happens. It, it works. It's not ideal. Quick time opening a bunch of times on someone's desktop, they're going to be like, eh. If they have brew installed, this is like two commands. After this crazy, you know, OSA script rabbit hole I ran down, if they have brew install, brew install socks. Socks dash D, fuck my life dot wave. Recording audio, easy peasy. How about recording video, maybe from the camera? I started to think about this and I started, no, too creepy. And I didn't want to deal with the, like, the light coming on, things like that. I didn't want to, you know, try and dig up that old exploit and get it working on the new stuff because I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't be able to do that. Hopefully. Hopefully. The real money is in cookie stealing though. All this, audio and video recording, it's, it's useful, it's neat, but stealing cookies, like it's the, the cookie jar is really where everything's at. I mean, it's where cookies are and cookies are delicious. On Linux, Google Chrome cookies right there. Firefox cookies there. 
The easiest thing to do is literally just grab that folder, spin up a VM, take your VM, open up a SOX proxy using your shell, browse through their computer. That way you're avoiding any IP whitelisting, any IP uh, GeoIP location restrictions, and you're, the traffic is coming out of their computer, and you're using a VM that's the same as their operating system, and then use the same browser. You just dump their folder of Chrome storage into your VM, and you open up Chrome, and all your cookies are there, all the sessions are there, everything's working great. None of this stuff is actually encrypted with a, like a dynamic password in Linux um, for, for both Chrome and Firefox. It's, uh, Chrome's encrypted with like a static password, like peanut or something like that. And Firefox is just like unencrypted. So if you drop your stuff in, you're browsing with their session. And if you're going through their box, you're, you're golden. Like you're already in email, etc. On OS X, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, there's the cookie file. It's actually encrypted. Now the key, is inside Chrome safe storage value inside the keychain, which is really no problem. You know, you could make the keychain ask them for their password, which is going to be their system password anyways. You could then steal the keychain, mount it on your own system, use their password to unlock it, grab this Chrome safe storage value. Chrome safe storage value is used to encrypt the cookies. To decrypt them, there's a decrypt Chrome cookies with Python Google result that has a script that only requires a few minor tweaks to get working. You insert your value, you give it a link to their cookie file, suddenly you can dump out their cookies in plain text. With that, you can insert them into your own browser, steal their sessions, ride their sessions in past 2FA, etc. A Windows, slightly more complicated. In order to uh, actually do this, you need to make an API call to crypt unprotect data, which is fairly undocumented. But if you just say, crypt unprotect data and you're on the system and you call this and you just give it the right parameters according to MSDN, it will just decrypt the cookies for you and then you can take them. Uh, this can be done with PowerShell if you have access to it. So in conclusion to this, cookies equal win. If you can steal cookies, you get the browser data, you get everything. This is, when I get this during a pen test, suddenly like everything just like cracks open, right? Because you have access to internal portals, internal wikis, you have the sessions already. If not, you have their password. You have a list of sites they go to from the cookies. You can see what they, what they normally do. You can just repeat the kind of same stuff that they do. Because as you're getting personal, you just repeat what the user does. You follow them to the stuff you want to get. Cookies are a good way. Looking at their bash history, following them around through that is a good way if they use it. All right, this is the end of the talk. I'd like to shout out, give some special thanks to Rick and Morty for not really allowing me to do this, but not caring that I did it anyways, not suing me yet. Raptor Jesus for the inspiration, uh, Google for all its help, stimulants for the very late nights, including vodka, my very best friend. Uh, the unassuming victims whose lives have been forever altered. Uh, and all of you for listening and or drinking, especially last night. Uh, is there any, any questions? No? Gonna get off easy? One? Have you ever encountered an organization that has 100% script based off and has hard code throughout? It seems like your password mechanism is kind of split. 100% cert based off and tokens with throughout. No. I have not encountered an organization like that. I imagine, so I imagine if they do that, right? there's going to be a window of time in which the token's on the system and it's valid, and the cert's on the system, and the user's moving somewhere already. So in that case, it, 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 will, it won't stop you, really. It will slow you down, right? So if, you, if the user is connecting to something already, like, you can follow them there, even if they have 2FA, right? You, you, use, you use something to prompt them, get their 2FA cred, immediately go to the same place as they go. You know it's going to be valid because they've already gone there. Um, the only problem with that is you need to get lateral movement to systems so you can figure out like, hey, I'm on like X admins machine, but I want to be on like Joe Bro's developer machine. So it, it'll make things slower and you'll have to be more targeted in phishing and you might have to get really creative, but I, I doubt it would, would stop. I mean, the real goal is to make things slower, right? So if you're like enhancing security stuff, if you're, if you're trying to make mitigations for this stuff, you can't cover every single creative solution, right? If you're on someone's box, you can, you can mess with stuff. But the goal is that you make the, 
the window for the detection much wider because you have to jump through all these hoops in order to, to actually get to where you want to go. The wider the detection window is, the more time you have to respond to it, the less likely you lose all your data before you see it. So, thanks for the question. Now we can get out of here. Let's go. Let's go do some 10 a.m. drinking, right, guys? Thank you.